All right, welcome back. So our next spotlight is the FBI and European incident response. And we are thrilled to be joined by Steve Cyrus. He is a legal attache, the FBA, the FBI Legat London. Uh, after serving in the US Army, Steve joined the FBI as a special agent in 1997. And during his 24, 25 plus years in the FBI, uh, Special Agent Cyrus has worked counterterrorism, counterintelligence, critical incident management, international operations, and of course, cyber matters. Uh, Legat Cyrus reported to London as the legal attache on May 24th, 2021. And now we're thrilled to have him with us today. Welcome, Steve. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. And I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our moderator, Ed Starkey. He's a senior vice president of cybersecurity risk at Kroll, based in London. At Kroll, he's engaged uh, in the board level advisory programs, developing Kroll's cybersecurity MA services for EMEA and acting as a virtual CISO. Uh, Ed's also regularly involved in data protection, GDPR, and HIPAA assessments. Ed, let me turn it over to you. Thank you ever so much. Um, feel a little bit, a little bit uh, small compared to your introduction there, Steve. But yeah, I'd just like to say thank you ever so much for for uh, for joining us today. Um, so, FBI cybersecurity. Um, so, if you could just give give us a, you know a quick introduction as to what your role is at the FBI, um, and yeah, I guess reflecting on some of your history as well. Absolutely. So. Um... I know folks, most folks kind of think of FBI, they think of uh, internally focused, they think of the US um, due to our, you know, our national security mandate to protect uh, you know, the US national security. And typically they, they kind of see us in that US based role. Uh, to talk about that just a little, just to give folks who I don't know uh, quite what the familiarity is. We got 56 field offices around the US. We have 350 resident agencies, uh, about 38,000 people overall. Um, mm -hmm. Most of those are based in the U.S. Um, the point of that, uh, you know, those all those offices is we want to be able to have um, a response to whatever incident may arise, whether it be in cyber or otherwise. Uh, we want to be able to have somebody on that person's doorstep within an hour. So having that ability, having the, the folks spread out over the country, those 350 offices uh, allows us to do that. Overseas. We have about 75 offices uh, in embassies around the world. Of that, uh, we also have uh, presence in about 100, a little more than 105 countries that we have FBI personnel assigned to. Uh, we also have dedicated cyber personnel in those offices that uh, we have spread through Europe. We have out in Asia and we have some in Eastern Europe as well to where uh, along with those folks that handle more general seat, uh, counterterrorism, counterintelligence matters, those offices that we have in those countries, we also have cyber personnel dedicated as well. So that's kind of the, the legal attache system in the bureau and kind of how we fit into that. Um, sure. so, as you heard, uh, I started, uh, as you and I were talking before, I started in Detroit, uh, working yep. uh, criminal uh, there in Detroit. It gives you an opportunity to see a lot of the, the criminal justice system from that angle. Uh, moved on. Uh, I started working counterterrorism, uh, counterintelligence, particularly focusing on uh, nation state threats. Uh, I did a lot of middle of my career was in the critical incident management. Uh, I was a member of the, our hostage rescue team. So a lot of the uh, critical incidents regarding negotiations, uh, tactical resolutions, things like that, but uh, a lot of incident response experience. And then lately, spent a couple of years working in our cyber division. And I did that right before I came here to London. Uh, and while at cyber, uh, focusing mainly on nation state threats as well. Uh, so that was, uh, that, was my, that was my background and what brings me to here. Sure, thank you, fantastic. And your kind of your, your day-to-day -day responsibility at the moment, so you've got this, you know, this history of working <clears throat> significant cases, significant incidents, and you mentioned that you're based in London uh, at, at the moment. So, you know, what is your what is your current scope of work and responsibility? So, our office here, uh, we are responsible for supporting all the FBI's programs and uh, investigations. And what that means, obviously, we have folks that are out here working counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and the criminal stuff, the more traditional. Um, but we also have folks here that are dedicated 
uh, mainly to, just to the cyber program, both on the criminal and national security side. The role of the League App program as a whole really is to have that relationship and to build the collaboration with your local law enforcement and national intelligence partners. So obviously here in uh, the UK, and we also handle Ireland as well. Mm -hmm. We're working with NCA, we're working with the Met on the law enforcement side and a lot of the more local constabularies for any cross uh, kind of investigative purposes that we may have or advancing US investigations and vice versa. And then on the intelligence side, working with the UK's intelligence community here, uh, oftentimes uh, we have mutual interests. Uh, everyone particularly on the cybersecurity side, everyone has an interest in kind of combating ransomware. Everybody has a uh, desire, kind of common desire to um, be as effective against nation state threats. So sure. our job here is to constantly be bringing what the FBI can to the table in terms of that intelligence and evidence collection, and making sure that we're feeding it into the UK and we're getting as much out of uh, that collaboration as possible uh, for both sides of the, the, the uh, proposition. Perfect. I'd like to come back to the point, if that's okay, about the the collaboration and the the intelligence insights. But you mentioned something um, that I guess would be really good to to kind of pick up on, and it was around the kind of the nation state, the the kind of the geopolitical angle. So um, I guess you know I'd like to just address that one, you know, head on really. So international events is, I guess, has there been a shift in the in the threat landscape? You know, what are you seeing in this in the, in this space at the moment? I would probably say, if, um, from what I'm seeing, and I would uh, speak from the bureau generally as a whole, we're not seeing a big change in the threat landscape. We're still seeing a lot of the. There's more that's similar than what's different uh, over the past, you know, six eight months. We're still seeing, and we'll kind of focus it mainly on the the Russia Ukraine side. We're seeing. We're still seeing. Russian cyber criminals uh, with ties to uh, the Russian government being used to advance what they see as the Russian government's foreign policy objectives against who, people who they believe to be adversaries. Sure. That's what, we saw that before. We're seeing it the same now. On the Russian intelligence side, we're still seeing uh, actors that we know tied to Russian intelligence services or government services using criminal TTPs or criminal uh, tools. Uh, one for possible plausible deniability to kind of uh, obfuscate who they're actually working for or what they're doing. Mm. But we're also seeing uh, potentially for moonlighting and potentially as a, a profit generation as well. So we saw that before uh, the invasion. We're still seeing it now. Yep. Uh, the only difference I would say is um, if we had, you know, if the volume was turned up to eight before, uh, it seems like it's up to 11 now. So it's sure. just more of what we're seeing. The only thing that I would add um, that may be slightly different, and this is something that has been correlated with uh, discussions with our UK counterparts as well, we are seeing the physical relocation of actors just mm -hmm. based on the fact that some of the places that they had been physically based are no longer possible to, to be based uh, and they'll continue the type of work they're you know choosing to do or the, you know, the, the attacks that they're doing just based on loss of, you know, uh, pro internet providers, et cetera. So sure. we're kind of displace some folks. The only other thing that I would say, and this is not uh, come completely to fruition, this may be a bit of a, a future look, mm -hmm. this pushing of the criminal and the intelligence services even closer together on the Russian side is something that could potentially last longer than even the, the war in Ukraine, because if you start pushing this together, it may not separate itself uh, sure. at the end of this as easily as what it came together at the beginning. So that's what we're seeing for the most part and what, what we've been um, getting from mainly our partners here as well. Yeah, and I, th I th think one of the things that you mentioned earlier about the intelligence side of things, you, uh, I guess, and you know, researching about this, this topic and, and you know, what the FBI does in this space, there's a lot of focus on outreach and broader engagement. Um, and that's public sector, that's private sector, a whole number of, you know, basically any organization out there. Um, I just wondered if you could kind of go into that in a little bit more, a little bit more detail, because I think that's, I guess, um, that links into the intelligence piece and the the, the, yeah. the information flow kind of backwards and forwards. So, yeah, if you could just touch upon the, um, I guess, that uh, 
the outreach and engagement that you have with um, organizations? Yeah, so our outreach, I think, um, it, can, it is, I think, becoming more robust, I think, for a couple reasons. One, uh, we at the FBI, we you know, are putting forth, uh, back in 2020, we started working on a new strategy for cybersecurity. And yep. part of that uh, effort that we put into it, and it was a enterprise-wide uh, redevelopment of our strategy, so much of what we saw is for us to have any uh, really any chance of being truly effective at countering these threats, we have to go out and have that engagement with private sector, other public sector uh, organizations. So that's led us to um, particularly nation state side and even on the criminal side, going out and, and trying to build those relationships prior to any incident. Yeah. We're very aware that, um, you know, on an incident response, going out and having that relationship built before any incident were to take place is critical to, to managing the, the long-term effects of what that incident may uh, kind of bring about for that organization. So we put great effort into identifying who we believe, you know, I'll speak just on the nation state side first. Who is it that we think is most attractive to some of our nation state counterparts? Who is it that's also most important for us to, to protect as the U.S. in order to maintain economic uh, technological and kind of military advantages along with our uh, Western partners. And we've made a concerted effort to go out and start that engagement as early as we can and start talking with those folks. On the criminal side, I think uh, we can all kind of agree that there are certain sectors that may be more uh, targeted, but I think everyone realizes on the criminal side, everyone is a, everyone is a target now, um, just based on, as you know, we're looking for access, not necessarily the type of target they're going after, they're just looking to be able to get access to networks. And that goes across to all the different sectors. So our outreach is something that we've really been pushing, not only in the US, but also internationally. And it's something that we're going to continue with our strategy and continue to build even deeper. Yeah. And what does that, you know, what does that look like? So let's say um, before an incident, you know, that's, you know, we mentioned that's obviously preferable. Yeah. So um, as an organization, if I was based in London, right. you know, what's the expectation from your end? Is it is it that, that we just, you know, approach the FBI and we start to try and build that relationship? Is that? Um, That's something to where it, it's a little bit unique in the overseas space and a little different than what it would be in the U.S. But ultimately, uh, reaching out to the Bureau uh, here in the U.K., our first question, and that's going to be whether it's before or whether it's during or even after an event, is going to be, you know, have you spoken to NCA or NCSC, you know, here in the UK? Because ultimately, we're going to partner with them. Uh, sure. Because this is, uh, you know, this is we're a host in this or we're a, a guest in this country, and we want to make sure that we're we're acting in the best interest of all the parties involved. But what that would look like, it could be uh, as really as robust as you want to make it. We what we have to offer in the Bureau and what I think, you know, back in the U.S. we're able to provide and what we could, uh, if folks here have U.S. operations or they want to have a discussion about how to, you know, kind of prepare beforehand here. Of course, we have cybersecurity subject matter experts. We have subject matter experts on ransomware variants, nation state actors, criminal actors, all those things that will help you know better how to protect your system because you know who may be looking to attack it or what the most logical kind of likely ways that they will be coming at you are. But sure. along with that, we're also, you know, we have people who are very comfortable in managing uh, critical incidents and incident response and not just in the, the cyber realm, uh, in other realms as well. While I know some, some parts of cybersecurity incident response can be unique. A lot of the principles, whether it's a, a critical incident for you know a terrorist event, a bank robbery, things like that. Those are all principles that you need to kind of kind of perpetuate in that incident response. We have people that can help you write that into your plan. We have folks who can help you build kind of consequence management of if it doesn't go quite the way you think it is. Um, we have negotiators who can help. Uh, should it you can build into your plan all these resources that will help you think about here are some eventualities that we'd like to get you uh, as comfortable with before the day of. Sure. 
we'll provide whatever resources we can to get you there and then provide whatever guidance we can having managed multiple incidents in the past. Yeah, I think that's, you know, a really key point that this um, backlog of, of knowledge and experience, you know, from previous incidents, um, as, yeah, as you said, cyber is fairly new, but the principles of incident management have remained fairly consistent. So in the event of, you know, the, the, the worst kind of the worst thing happening as an organization, you know, we've, we've reached out, we've had a conversation and I'm hit, uh, I'm hit with a ransomware incident. Um, I guess going from the from the proactive to the reactive side, what kind of support would the FBI um, provide, you know, to me as an organization? Right. I think it, no matter where we are in the kind of that continuum of engagement that we've had before, mm. when you're calling us and telling us that you're in the middle of some sort of uh, either a ransomware attack or some sort of uh, network incident, we're always going to be able to provide you information of here are other people that may be experiencing, and not by people, not necessarily specific organizations, but giving you this is something that's also happening in other places around the world. The, we know other organizations are being affected and here are ways that other people are potentially going about solving the problem. We can sure. also talk about best practices that may have worked or may not have worked in the past. We can also provide IOCs or other things that you can try to do to try to determine on your network what's really happening. We'll eventually get around to um, maybe trying to determine who's actually doing it, but ultimately that first little bit for you and for us is going to be built around how can we help you fully define what's going on within your network? Sure. And at best contain it and isolate it as, uh, as best that we can. Sure. And you mentioned there the, the intelligence and the collaboration across um, different different government agencies. You know, it, when you're looking at that kind of, that, well, those kind of instances, you're pulling on that that intelligence. Is, is that right? So, um, you know, you're, when you tap into the FBI, you're not just tapping into the FBI, you're tapping into the FBI, the, I guess, the, N the NTSC. Um. That's exactly. And you're also, if you're in London, you're not just tapping into the FBI in London or our relationships here with NCA and NCSC. Um, you're also going to be tapping into uh, our, our office in Tokyo. You're going to be talk, tapping into our office in New York. All kind of worldwide network that we built to collect that intelligence and that information about what may be happening in other places other than our AOR, that's all going to get fed into here at London because we have victims here as well. And we want to make sure that we're providing information that may be collected worldwide, but we're giving access to people here that can also use it to help solve their problem also. Sure. And I guess the, the other thing is this isn't um, this isn't something that's just been um, that there's just been developed. You've been as I guess as an organization, you've been doing this for a number of years and you've had some successes. Um, with a number of, I guess, criminal gang takedowns. Um, so I guess the, the question would be, how does, you know, the FBI and the private sector collaborate in these instances? So, um, yeah. yeah, I think one of, one of the, the best examples that we've seen and the one that, and I'm just going to talk from personal experience because it's one that I was involved in. Um, while not criminal, uh, I think you may be familiar with the, the Hathium uh, intrusions and that, that back in, March of 2021, as you know, March of 2021, uh, they announced they had Microsoft server vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw early on that uh, a good bit of those early vulnerabilities, they were being exploited uh, by the PRC and PRC actors that was attributed via Microsoft. It was also attributed via USG. We were working with, with Microsoft to understand kind of the time horizon on getting that patch put together. We'd work with the manage the service providers uh, to understand what's the scale of the people that are affected by this. We've seen we saw a, a web shell being inserted on thousands of different uh, victims. Overall, I think working with those providers, we were able to identify over 10,000 U.S. victims that had the vulnerability and also had a web shell inserted onto their network. Of that 10,000. We broke it down. Uh, we had victims at all 56 of our field offices, and we literally pushed those victims out to all 56, and we had personal contact with the companies in one way or another to make sure that they were aware of the vulnerability. After all that, Microsoft put out their patch. Uh, I know a lot of the providers provided you know, kind of notification that you should be going in and patching your system, and this is how you remove the, the web shell that may be on there. 
we actually then went through and we were able to identify uh, hundreds of networks that had not been able to remove the web shell. And we actually did a search warrant and went through and removed all those shells off the networks because we just didn't want to leave that vulnerability on folks' system that sure. they may not know is there or may not have the ability to remove themselves. Yeah. I think there's, you mentioned a couple of things there. You mentioned like the, the search warrant, and I guess that's the the move from cyber from the cyber realm into the into the, the physical space. Um, and I guess uh, kind of almost linked to that. You mentioned that you had a, a new cyber strategy in in kind of 2020. Um, so if we were going to have this conversation in you know five years time, what would how would you be defining success? You know, what would you be looking to to talk about? I think for us, um, what is success for us really is building the relationships with the organizations uh, and the sectors that we know that are most at risk. And the reason for that is I would love to be able to say that somehow we're going to you know, have this significantly degrade uh, the cyber security threats out there. I, I have trouble believing that that may necessarily be the case. I think it's something sure. where, like so many other domains that the Bureau and uh, other agencies work in, the threat's always going to be there. You're just finding better and better ways to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way for us is building that relationship with those private sector organizations that we know are critical for us to maintain their cybersecurity, not only for the economic and technolo technological advantages that they maintain, but just make sure that, you know, they're not being hit by ransomware. They're not being constantly uh, kind of built or hit upon by criminal actors. Having a plan, having the bureau written into that plan, having a team of folks that you know when you have a really bad day, you have a plan put together, you have a team put together, you've exercised it, mm -hmm. and you have a way forward to know that if something does sneak through, it's not going to be crippling. You're going to have a way to get up, back up as quickly as possible. That for us is a success. We still are a law enforcement agency. so bringing risk and consequence to the people that is doing this is something we always have an interest in as well. And we will constantly be pursuing that. But we also know there's multiple definitions of success for this strategy. And one of them is making our partners as prepared as possible to meet these threats and making sure that we've offered them every uh, kind of resource that we can to prepare them for that. Sure. I think you mentioned there that I think the common, well, one of the common themes here, you know, the partnership, the collaboration. Um, uh, I guess before I met you, I might have been intimidated to approach the FBI as, you know, as an organization. Um, I still might be intimidated. So, you know, how does one go about doing that? Is is it just as simple as, I don't know, dropping someone an email, you know, triggering that interaction? Is, um, it really can be. Um, most of our interactions with uh, and I'll, I'll speak to the U.S. and then internationally. In the U.S., it really is nothing more than a call to a field office. So if you have U.S. operations, mm -hmm. if you call to the field office and you want to speak to the cyber supervisor to talk about your cybersecurity concerns, that's very simple. That's, the, that's where uh, the majority of our contact starts. Um, the most, most important kind of metric for our success is the cooperation of our partners or our private sector partners and the public just having reaching out and starting that conversation to explain here's what what i'm up against here's what i'm trying to solve are the things that uh, we should be doing to prepare what resources can you provide me hmm. that's an easy that's an easy start i guarantee you, you will find a very receptive audience in the bureau on the international side we operate here out of the embassy it's an easy uh, discussion there as well to have a call into the embassy, speak to the FBI. We'll, of course, uh, want to have a discussion about, you know, who else you may be speaking to on your own side to make sure you're receiving, you know, that information from your own uh, kind of host country partners as well. But we are always happy to, to meet and have that conversation about what you're trying to accomplish in your cybersecurity requirements. Great. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. So we've got uh, one minute left. I see that uh, Bruce has um, joined us again. Um, Steve, thank you ever so much for your um, for your time today. Um, where can people go to to find out more information? I guess about you know what the FBI is up to. 
Yeah, you can certainly go to uh, the FBI's website and we have uh, a connection there on the cyber side. It will connect you to any field office close. It'll also show you every legal attache office that we have. It's something that uh, nothing more than a call. Obviously, we'll talk about cybersecurity. We'll also provide you a more in-depth overview of you know, what the threat may be overall, not just on the cyber side, but more traditional uh, counterintelligence, more uh, you know, intelligence related threats toward your organization as well. We're happy to provide all of that. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for your time and we're really grateful for your participation. Ed, great job moderating and uh, thank you.